Musician Podcast with creator and host Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes, and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. On this episode of the Career Musician Podcast, we welcome Harvey Mason Jr., interim president for the Recording Academy, multi-award winning mega producer with credits including Aretha Franklin, Michael Jackson, Bobby Brown, Avant, B2K, Babyface, Backstreet Boys, Brandy, Brian McKnight, Britney Spears, Omarion, Charlie Wilson, Ciara, Craig David, Fantasia, Fifth Harmony, Jennifer Hudson, Joe, Beyonce, Jordan Sparks, Casey and Jojo, Luther Vandross, Mario. But wait, there's more. That's right. His filmography is just as impressive with Jesus Christ Superstar Live, Valley Girl, Pitch Perfect, Dream Girls, Monster, Sing, The Wiz Live, Straight Outta Compton, Get On Up, The James Brown Story. The list literally goes on. And Harvey Mason Jr. is the man to listen to when it comes to getting your game straight in this crazy business we call music. Check it out right here on the Career Musician Podcast. Harvey Mason Jr., welcome to the Career Musician Podcast. So glad to have you, my friend. Thank you, buddy. I'm glad to be here. It's been a minute. It has. It has. It's been a long minute, and a lot has transpired uh, for both of us and for the, the music world in general. But man, you have been busy. I've been very fortunate, very thankful to be busy. I know there's a lot of people that are less busy, so you'll never hear me complain. Uh, a lot of what I've been busy doing, though, hopefully will be helpful to the industry and helpful to music creators and music people across the country. And that's really what I'm spending a lot of time on. Man, that's really great to hear. Let's start there, if you don't mind. The whole premise of the career musician is to empower musicians with strategies for a sustainable career. And uh, it, obviously that lines exactly up with what you're talking about. Can you tell us about your position as the president of the Recording Academy and, and your agenda there? Yeah, well, I mean, Michael, you know, I'm a, I'm a songwriter and a record producer and I produce right. film and TV stuff. So I consider that to be my profession and I am a career musician. I've been uh, making my living exclusively through music and my music efforts uh, it's, been the only job I've ever had. But somewhere along the line, I ran for uh, chair of the board of the Recording Academy and was elected uh, because I was involved in the LA chapter and really felt like giving back to the music community was important. So as elected chair, I started to really look at the academy and see what we could do better, what we could change. And midway through being a chair at the academy, we ended up having a falling out with our CEO. So they appointed me the interim president and CEO. So now I'm the chair and the president and CEO. So in that capacity, I'm able to really have a, a change and affect the change on a pretty big level uh, through the academy and through its resources and affiliates and things that we do. So my agenda has really been, especially since COVID, trying to be helpful to music people and music creators uh, and our music family. And it's members and non-members. You know, we, we have 24,000 members 
members, but the music community is much bigger than that. And so all of our services are really set up to help music people. So we have Music Cares, for example, during COVID, we raised $25 million to give back to musicians who needed rent money or food or medical bills or, you know, loss of income, you know, because everybody's out of work. You know it, I know we all see it. So the Music Cares, we did some great work. The museum, we're doing amazing work. Really important to some of the stuff we're doing in DC right now and making sure that music people are protected and considered in some of the relief and stimulus packages that are being passed because a lot of times we're overlooked. You know, sometimes we're dual income uh, earners through W-9 and, and, and our I-9s and W-4s. Depending on where our income comes from, some, sometimes we'll fall through the cracks on some of this new legislation and making sure that people are paying attention to us as mixed income earners is a big deal so that we can get some of this unemployment money and some of the stimulus money. So very active there. Uh, continuing to make sure we fight for intellectual property rights holders that we can monetize our art, things like that. So that's some of the things that we're really intent on getting done. Matt, it's incredible. Thank you for that full scope. I read the article in the AFM magazine, which obviously covered this very issue. So we, we do appreciate that you are advocating on the behalf of all musicians everywhere. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. But like, let's go back. Like you said, primarily you're a songwriter producer. That's what you've built your whole career upon. So how do you find managing your time, even on a daily basis, weekly? You know, do you work in a module type setting where, OK, I couldn't do this today, so I'm going to have to shift it over here? And you know, it must be pretty difficult. Yeah, it is. But I'm fortunate Again, like a lot of people don't have the luxury, so I I feel bad even talking about it, but I I have a studio. So I can go from my house, which I I wake up, I exercise, I get to the studio pretty early every day, 9, 10 o'clock, and then I'm here all day. And I'm doing academy business, I'm taking Zoom calls, I'm making phone calls, I'm on the computer. And then just right over there through that door is the control room and the performance room. So there's, you know, very small staff, people that are working because of COVID, engineer, assistant engineer, and two other people that work here. And we're doing, you know, sessions. A lot of it's remote, a lot of it's through Zoom, but we're creating, we're writing songs. And I'm just bouncing back and forth between my office and the studio pretty much all day until I get tired and I can't take any more. And then I go home and lay down. <laughs> I love that, man. I love it. You know, I noticed that when I first started working with you uh, several years ago, I came to your studio and I really liked it, the feng shui, if you will, how you have it all set up. Like you said, you have some, some office space, some creative space. And then this is the part that really inspired me, your little gym in the in the main room, in the live room. I thought that was super cool. Actually, I did the same thing because I asked you one day, I was like, Harvey, how do you stay in such good shape, man? <laughs> you know, music takes so much time. You're like, well, look through the glass. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Studio in the gym does it every Man, time. I love that. That's awesome. So if you don't mind, let's take kind of a little detour. Let's talk about that. University of Arizona and the Final Four, some of your teammates that you played with. I mean, uh, Sean Elliott from the Spurs, Steve Kerr from the Bulls. So you started off in a musical family, but then did you kind of veer off and do athletics or was it all comprised together? It was really all done together. I was taking piano lessons as a kid. And shooting jump shots all, you know, at the same time. So I, I played ball. And then uh, around high school, I was still really into writing songs and making music and had a little like kind of home studio set up. But I was also playing playing ball. And so I ended up getting uh, an offer to go play at the University of Arizona and was recruited by a bunch of schools, but ended up choosing there. And played for four years and had a great run. As you said, some amazing teammates learned so much from a lot of people there. I had a great coach, Lute Olson, Hall of Fame coach. Uh, and during that four-year period, I didn't do a lot of music. I did some just in my dorm dorm room, you know, kind of more of a hobby just to have a, an outlet and a release as a, as a songwriter. Uh, but my focus was sports. And then my senior year, I tore my ACL, ending my career, and that really pointed me back towards uh, dedicating all my time and energy towards music. And I started pretty much right then, my senior year after I hurt my knee, I was super depressed. You know, I wanted to play in the NBA. All my teammates played in the NBA. I was one of, I think, three guys on my team to not go into the league. Wow. So I was pretty bummed and just used music as you know therapy and healing, and it took a year of just writing songs and sitting in my dorm room playing the piano. And then I started a company doing jingle music, if you can believe that. So I was doing jingles for, and I was in Tucson at University of Arizona. So I was doing the break store down the street, you know, the burger shop and the Mexican <laughs> restaurant and doing 30 second, 60 second jingles to make money. 
And uh, that's really what got me started earning a living with music. That's incredible. Wow. So it's really cool to hear that one of the industry's biggest producers and writers started off in a jingle business. That's, (laughs) that's really encouraging. It goes to show you that, you know, Hey, we got to just start, right? Yeah. For me, it was fun because I'd always grown up writing full three or four minute songs and then trying to compress that into a 30 or 60 second spot and tell the story and, and convey the information. And that's important listening to clients, listening to people, what they wanted, being able to tailor your music to that was really a training ground for me to take into my career, which is listening to a record executive and what they want versus the owner of a, you know, of a bike store or listening to the artists and what's going on in their lives uh, compared to listening to an ad executive at a TV station or radio station telling you how to, you know, attract, the audiences so it was really great training uh and it was a lot of different styles of music as you can imagine some days you're doing a country jingle and you they don't want a rock jingle and i want a rap jingle right. so you get to put your hands on a lot of different sounds so all of it was really good training for me so when i was able to start making records i had uh, not the same level but i had experienced all the different kind of trials and tribulations of dealing with different people with different stakeholders and also having a handle on different styles of music Man, that is perfect. And like you said, you're the liaison between the artists, the executives, the whole whole system right. itself. That's amazing. Yeah, that's so, crazy. It going even further back, your father, Harvey Mason Sr., fantastic, like legendary drummer, co-founder of the amazing contemporary jazz group, Foreplay. What was that like? And then I'm reading about how you were growing up in the studios. You were going to his sessions, hanging with Quincy Jones, Carol King, the Brothers Johnson. I mean... That must have been a really cool childhood. It was great. You know, as a child, you don't realize it. You just think it's normal. And so I kind right. of just <laughs> ingested all that information, experiences as just run of the run of the mill everyday life. Um, looking right. back now, I see how really fortunate I was and how it completely influenced and impacted my whole life, my whole career uh, in so many ways. But, you know, being around a musical family, of course, you some of it just drains off onto you, the talent and just the ear and understanding music my dad was a studio musician so again I, I saw a lot of different styles of music i would go to work with him i did cartage for him one summer with a van and moved his drums around from studios yeah i've done every job in this industry i'll tell you what michael but That's growing awesome. up with those type of musicians also taught me a level of expectation a level a bar of excellence that mm-hmm. i would have never been exposed to had i not grown up with you know going to quincy jones session or seeing some of the people you mentioned so when I got into the business myself at a later stage in life, I was like, oh, we've got to make it better. we got to make it sound better. We have to make the lyrics better. The musicianship should be a certain level. And so I think that challenged me and pushed me to really um, do some of my best work, hopefully. That's incredible. So all of this really informed your career path. And now coming from the school uh, situation and not being able to play the sports, then reinventing yourself with the jingle business, what were the next steps? How did the trajectory work out? How did you really become this A-list producer songwriter? Well, it was really a passion of mine writing songs. You know, as I said, I've always been writing songs since I was young, all the way through high school and college. And I realized uh, I wasn't going to play basketball and as soon as I hurt my knee, I, I thought, well, okay, I want to go into the music business. Uh, being in Tucson, there was no record business there. And the right. only business was, how could I make money selling music? And that was through jingles. So my intent always from day one was to be in the music industry as far as making records. The jingle thing was a, a, a stepping stone for me as a way to generate money. And I needed money because I needed to get to California. And so I needed gas. I needed a place to stay. I needed um, equipment. And so every time I do a jingle and I got income, I would say, okay, this is going to get me three trips to LA. And I would drive to LA and I'd stay with a friend or I'd stay with you know, my dad if he was in town or uh, wherever I needed to stay. And I would be shopping my demos. I, you know, While I'm doing jingles, I'm not just doing jingles. I'm writing songs and I'm trying to think, oh, this would be a great song for uh, at the time it was like Blackstreet or Jodeci or Brandy or whoever it was. And so I'm writing songs, I'm driving to LA with my demos in between my jingle business and trying to basically stalk people and give them my cassettes and throw cassettes at people that I know maybe would listen to them. Um, so that was the next step after the jingle business. And every time I did a jingle, I would buy a piece of equipment. I would buy, see your wow. studio, you have like every piece of equipment in the world, but <laughs> I had nothing. You know, I had a Kurzweil K2000 and then I bought an MPC. So uh, when I would 
earn you know 500 or 800 bucks or a thousand dollars on a jingle then i'd buy a little elisa's compressor or a cheap microphone and i just kind of mm-hmm. built up my demo studio so that i could make music get out to la and shop it so that was the next step for me then that's that grind that initiative that you have to take you have a plan you formulate it and you just put it into action right you don't waste yeah. time sitting there you know contemplating you just make it yeah. happen you see that very very infrequently these days right. a lot of people are trying to think about what they want to do and how am i going to get there and who's going to give me a hand up and um i'm not trying to preach but i, I really think the onus is on each person who wants to be in this industry and you have to realize that it's the most competitive industry in the world it's probably harder to be a professional songwriter than it is to be in the nba to be honest wow so there's just so many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that want to do it you have to take the initiative and you have to just start and get out there and get out and get after it. Hey, I'm Harvey Mason Jr. You're listening to Career Musician with the Nomad and I too am a career musician. Go behind the scenes with host Nomad to gain inside knowledge of entertainment business from the world's leading musicians, artists, producers, managers, and more. Help us continue to provide you with new and engaging content by getting our ratings up. Please subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Now, you didn't get yeses to every meeting that you took. Like you said, you were stalking people. You're trying to get into doors. I mean, you know, you t- it takes a thousand no's before you get one yes, right? And you're a testament to that, I'm sure. Thousand is a conservative number. Yes, I got a lot of no's. There were a lot of no's, a lot of come back when you're ready. But I had one important tor- turning point for me. It was a guy that I met at Motown Records. Guy Abrams was his name. I'll never forget. He was an A and R Motown Records, and instead of a no, he said, "Come to my office. I want to play you something." And he sat me down in his office and he played me a record that he had A and R. And then he said, give me your demo. Let me play it. And he played them back to back. And he said, you hear the difference between your demo and this record that I just Mm -hmm. finished? I said, well, yeah, you're making a record. You got like a mix and the drums are cracking and the vocals crisp and the chords are really nice. He's okay, well, until your demo is as good as this record, don't come back. And that's really what he told me. And I was like, Oh, shoot. And I tried to make every excuse in the book. I was like, well, I don't have a studio budget and I don't have, you know, a singer. And he said, well, that's all excuses until your demo sounds like this record. I say it again. Don't come back. And so I took that to heart and I went back to Arizona and I still remember the drive. I was just listening, listening to the record all the way back that he played me. And when I got back to Arizona, I just started rethinking how I was writing and how I was producing and how I was working. And I notched it up another level as far as the intensity and the effort and the studying and the thinking and the strategizing. It wasn't just like, oh, make some noise that comes out on the end of my fingers on the piano. It was like, okay, what am I doing here? How do I make it great? How do I make it appealing? How do I make it competitive with what I've just heard? What do I need to do to get better? And that was a turning point for me. Absolutely. So we're not making demos. We're making masters, period. That's the name of the game, right? Well, this was also 25 years ago or maybe more. I don't know. Even more difficult. Ago. Yeah. So even more difficult. Right now, it's easy. I mean, everybody's exactly. making masters on their laptop. It's not <laughs> even close. So that's a dumb story now. <laughs> no, it's actually an amazing and inspiring story because – like we've all heard it before, take the gear you have and make it work, right? Like I started right. on, on a, a four track task am. I'm, I'm sure similar stories for you as well. Of course, of course, so, yeah. you know, you take what you have and, and you just make do with it. So that's amazing. Um, so you get all these no's, you finally get a yes, but along the way you get some people to help you. So that's great. That guy gave you that in, insight. Yeah. Um, now fast forward, you're working with the likes of Aretha Franklin, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Chris Brown, Luther. I mean, the list goes on. It doesn't happen overnight. As we can see, you're telling us mm-hmm. it's, it's an evolution. There's crazy work ethic involved, right? Let's talk about the studio etiquette. So maybe some musicians are listening to this saying, man, I dream of being in the studio with Harvey Mason Jr. working on a track or, you know, let's talk about how to conduct yourself in the studio. Like you said earlier, you have to be that liaison between the the executive side and the artistic side and so forth. Well, to me, being in the studio, the people I like to be in the studio with are people that have the right energy. And I guess that's, uh, there are a lot of levels to that. But for me, it's about 
being collaborative, being open, being positive, being a yes person, not a yes man where you're just like, I'll do anything you tell me, but being solution based and being, uh, how do I get the, to the best result regardless of who comes up with it? You know, egos is not something that I do well with. Uh, I have to deal with artists that have big enough egos for all of us. So when it comes to people that I work with and collaborate with, it's really not something that I have a lot of energy for. It's like, we all are talented. We all love making music. So the people that I gravitate towards are people who have a lot of fun, who are, again, very open to collaborate and who uh, bring a positivity and an energy of, uh, you know, like a bias for yes type of action. Those are the people that I like. Right. Obviously, being talented and having done the work to get to the point where you're really good is important. But I, I take that as a general assumption. Anybody that I'm going to work with has to be talented, has to be awesome, has to be pretty much a master at their craft. And I think that's probably a different question. How do you get to that point? But as far as yes. the people that I like to work with, it really has a lot to do with energy and trying to accomplish greatness together. That's that's perfect. Again, somebody listening saying, how do I get these opportunities? Where do they start? Maybe somebody's moving from another state, right? They want to come out to LA. Where literally in this day and age, because like you said, the business has changed so much in mm -hmm. 20, you know, even 10 years. What's a good starting place for a young musician that wants to get into these positions? The starting place to me hasn't changed that much. It's finding people at your level that you can work with and grow with and collaborate with and Number one, perfect your craft, but number two, expose yourself through your work to other people at the next tier. Mm -hmm. So when I started, again, this was in Tucson, I'm writing records, I'm doing my jingles, but I'm writing records. And when Guy Abrams played me that demo, I didn't, ha I didn't sing like that record. I didn't even really necessarily play piano like that record, but what I did know is what it sounded like. And so I found people at my level. I went backstage to concerts. I went to, to clubs. I went to uh, music schools. And I started finding people that I thought were talented. I said, hey, man, you can really sing. I got a song for you to sing. Come over to my, my house. And he'd come to my house and we'd sing a song. And I'd be like, I need a bass player. Let me find the best yeah. bass player that I know at my level that I can yeah. get. I mean, they're not going to get, you know, Mike Rapola to come play guitar on something, but they'll get somebody at their level to come play on their record. And number one, that's building your, your, your resume and your, your platform and your, your body of work. But number two, it's also practice, right? You're, you're able to practice in an environment where you're not going to get knocked down by somebody saying you didn't do the right thing. You're not going to get judged. It's early in your career. You're building your platform and you're practicing and getting great at your craft. And I did that for a lot of time with my people from Tucson. And through that work and through the, the things that we made and through the improvements that I made and through the content that we made, people started hearing, of course, because you got to hustle and you got to get yourself out. So nowadays that's easy. It's emailing, it's, you know, DMing, it's all the normal crap that people are doing to me all the time, but sending stuff that you've perfected over however many touches that you needed to get there mm -hmm. with how many people you needed to collaborate with. And so for somebody moving to LA, it's find people at your level to work with, do it a ton, and then start marketing yourself with the music that you've made. But it's got to be great. It's got to be a like I said, competitive. So if your music is at the level where it's competing with things that are on Apple or on Spotify or on Tidal, then you're at the you're at the place where you're ready to start playing for people. Until that point, collaborate more and meet more people. I love that. That's perfect. Let's talk about music biz. You mentioned communicating through email and DMs. You also mentioned marketing. It seems like today, marketing is everywhere. And the tools to learn how to market your product, your, your music, are all over, right? The, the resources are plentiful. Mm -hmm. It seems a little bit like we have to be almost more focused on the business side of it, the marketing, the business. Uh, you know, that's a fine, delicate balance. But you have done an amazing job. Your business acumen is on point. Working with you, it's always like, you know, A++. And your market, your image, everything is on point. Now, it takes a team, obviously, um, but you know, where do we put our focus as, as the younger community coming up, where should they, it's so difficult and, and still hard to stand out from the crowd, right? When you're on IG and YouTube or TikTok, whatever, it's still hard to stand right. out. The only way to stand out is through excellence. In my opinion, at something, right. if you're a musician, I mean, if you're an influencer, you can stand out by doing something crazy or being naked or whatever. But right. if you're a musician or an artist, the way you stand out is through excellence you know, being That's really right. amazing at something. I mean, 
I've found people online, guys that you know play instruments, a drummer that was just all he did was post uh, videos of himself playing loops on on Instagram. I'm like, God, that guy's amazing. He's doing something really special. I love this guy. Right. I hit him on DM, and he does sessions for me. So right. there's ways to market yourself if you're great. If you're average or below average, you can do everything you want in the world. And you're not going to attract the attention you need to have a sustainable music career. The, the key to everything is excellence. And, and I, like I talked about at the beginning, having that level of expectation for yourself and raising the bar to the point where you're not going to accept anything other than a level that's comparable to the best people in the, in the business at your prospective career path that there are. And once you get to that point, the marketing part is easy because people mm-hmm. are going to find you and they're going to see you. That's right. Words of wisdom to live by. Man, I love that. Hey, wrapping things up, memorable moments. I know you have so many. It's probably hard to even, you know, comprehend <laughs> any one particular moment. I mean, come on, you've worked with the kings and queens of the biz, Michael and Rita and Whitney. And like we said, you know, the list literally goes on. It's, it would take too long to list everybody. Uh, not to mention, of course, your filmography as well. Uh, any memorable moments that stick out? This is one day this man came into my studio, he had a long thumbnail, and he could play the heck out of the guitar. His name was Michael Rapole. <laughs> I was like, this is a turning point for me in my career. This guy You're right crazy, here is man. Come on. the baddest on the guitar ever. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, that was, I definitely Thank have you. enjoyed working with you, man. No question. So talented. Thank you so, so uh, well-rounded. It's always a pleasure. But it, my career has been weird because... I have had the strangest convergence of, you know, perfect storm events that have all come to happen for me. And pretty much everybody I grew up listening to and respecting and loving and just like nerding out to, I ended up working with just weirdly. And right. I've um, just been really lucky to be across the, the booth or through the glass from some people that were so spectacular. Um, and I don't know exactly what to attribute that to other than like we talked about just really working myself to the point where I was good and I got good at something that people wanted or needed and respected. So memories are generally about starting from scratch with an artist, starting with nothing on tape or on the computer and leaving the studio after a couple of days work with a, a record that we're really proud of, whether that's, you know, Justin Timberlake or Justin Bieber, or, you know, there's been times where we're just sitting there like, okay, what are we going to do today? And we don't have anything. We get on the piano or the guitar or, and we leave the room with a song that we're really proud of. And for me, those are the memories that I love. And a lot of them involve some of the artists you said, Aretha or Michael, and some of them are new artists that I just, you know, we worked with Justin Timberlake on his first record. So no one was really messing with uh, Justin Timberlake. He yeah. was part of a boy band at that point. Or Chris Brown was 14 when we started with him. It was his very first session. You know, So yeah. some of them are the icons, but a lot of them are just new young artists that are amazingly talented. And when you hear them sing your song, you're just like, your mind is blown. And that's always a memory for me that I love. That's perfect. Man, Harvey Mason Jr., thank you so much. Everything that you say here comes from tried and true experience and knowledge and, of course, the wisdom that that you've crafted all that experience into. So we are grateful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. My hope is that we can continue to thrive in this music community and we can set the table for a lot of people to come up that have so much talent and so much uh, to give in the way of artistic offerings. You know, we have a little bit of a brain drain going on right now where a lot of the great talented musicians are having to go get other jobs and other careers. And I go, I got to go sell real estate or I'm going to go into financial service or do something because we're not taking care of our our artists, musicians uh, properly. So I hope in the next uh, part of my career in life, we can reverse that, change that, make it so that great musicians like yourself and others that are coming up behind you can continue to thrive and make a living and be career musicians. Follow the career musician at Facebook, Instagram, and sign up for the career musician newsletter at thecareermusician.com. Being a career musician is more than just gigs and sessions. Are you a career musician? Find out on the career musician podcast streaming everywhere. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man 
writing the songs in this one man band. I know man. This is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.